Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, winter warning. The fight against COVID taking a turn for the worse. Across the country, scenes like we saw early on in the pandemic. Long lines for testing and case numbers reaching record highs as the fast-spreading Omicron variant takes hold. We expect Omicron to be a fast and temporary phenomenon. We expect these next weeks to see a very, very big surge in the number of cases. Now with Christmas just days away, health officials urging Americans to rethink their holiday plans will take you to the area's hardest hit. An abundance of caution, more signs of a major setback, the COVID surge forcing closures, cancellations and delays. We have the latest on the impact from the Broadway stage to the world of sports. Reversal, a major setback for President Biden's Build Back Better Act. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin now saying he cannot support the social and climate plan, likely killing the bill. More on his decision plus reaction from Capitol Hill to the White House. And box office smash, the new Spider-Man movie giving a much needed boost to theaters with an impressive turnout in its opening weekend. More on the film that's giving hope to an industry that has struggled through the pandemic. Good to have you with us on this Monday morning. We do want to begin with new warnings about the rapid rise in coronavirus cases just days before Christmas. Some states are reporting more daily COVID cases now than at any other time during the pandemic. That includes New York State, where more than 22,000 people have tested positive for the coronavirus in the past day. More than half those cases are in New York City alone. But Omicron's impact is far-reaching. Cases are up nationwide, with an average of 130,000 infections reported daily. The new spike has now made its way to the halls of Congress. Senators Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren have tested positive just days after being on the Senate floor. Both say their cases are mild since they're both vaccinated and boosted. For some, it is starting to feel like March 2020 with long testing lines and some restaurants and entertainment shutting down. But there is a big difference this time around. We have vaccines and boosters. And new this morning, Moderna says its booster holds up well against Omicron. Dr. Anthony Fauci has this message for people ahead of the holidays. If people need to travel and want to travel for the obvious family reasons, during this holiday season. If you're vaccinated and you're boosted and you take care when you go into congregate settings like airports to make sure you continually wear your mask, you should be okay. We have a team breaking down the spread of Omicron here in the U.S. and overseas. We also have a doctor ready to answer our questions about this spike in cases. But first, let's go to MSNBC anchor Lindsay Reiser in Omicron's new epicenter, New York City, which was, of course, COVID's first major epicenter back in early 2020. Lindsay, here we go again. New York State reporting a record number of cases, long testing lines, which you showed us at the end of last week. Some businesses and Broadway shows are closing. What is the state of Omicron in New York City right now? Yeah, Joe, uh, you said it, and I'm sure you feel it. It's eerily similar to March of 2020. Every day, it feels like more places are announcing closures or postponements. For example, NBA, NHL, NFL. You mentioned Broadway. The Rockettes canceled the rest of their season for the year because of breakthrough cases among their production. Some restaurants are seeing breakthrough cases among staff, so they're having to close. But I I'm going to repeat some of the numbers that you mentioned. We've got 22,500 cases statewide uh, that were just announced yesterday. Yesterday by the governor. That's another record three days in a row, an 11 month high here. Uh, actually, it's a state record rather, not just an 11 year high, um, 11 month high. And when we're also talking about cases in New York City, we're talking about about half of those are here. Uh, so the situation is pretty dire. The mayor, uh, outgoing Mayor Bill de Blasio, an incoming mayor Eric Adams held a rare weekend briefing yesterday to talk to people about Omicron. Uh, let's go ahead and listen to what uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio said. We expect Omicron to be a fast and temporary phenomenon. We expect these next weeks to see a very, very big surge in the number of cases, more than we've seen previously. We can weather that storm if more and more people get vaccinated, more and more people go get those boosters. 
So he did say this isn't March of 2020. We do have vaccines. We do have therapeutics. And I want to show you guys a graphic if we're able to pull it up of the hospitalizations, because yes, we are seeing cases uh, and records here in this state, but the hospitalizations in the state then and now January versus now are still only about half. So that is a sliver of good news there, Joe. Yeah, that is good to hear. I know anecdotally, I've heard more sirens in the city over the last few days, but hopefully the hospitalization numbers stay lower than what we saw during the peak. You know, Lindsay, we're also seeing a growing debate nationwide about making schools go remote. Mayor de Blasio has said there are no plans to make school go online. But how do teachers feel about that? What are we hearing from them? Yeah, he's pretty adamant he doesn't want to close schools. And I spoke with the head of the teachers union for New York Public Schools, and he was the same. He says we've seen uh, some pretty disastrous effects of having kids remote for so long. Uh, he wants to see kids and teachers in school as well. Uh, but look, he wants to see testing up. He says right now there's too much of a lag in testing results. And we also know that there have been school closures. I mean, a lot of them. I believe we have a graphic where we can show you as well. Four schools completely are closed due to cases. That includes nearly 600 classrooms, but close to 3,000 partial classroom closures due to some quarantines. Let's listen to what uh, the, the head of the teachers union told me about the situation. The schools are still the safest place in the community, but when we see numbers jump like that, um, it, it, it really causes more concern. I mean, we've been, just been in this pandemic too long and uh, people's nerves and anxieties are pretty much frayed everywhere. So it's not a good position to do, and we're just trying to do everything in our power to get uh, to uh, basically Thursday at 3 p.m. safely. Of course, that's when winter break starts. And Joe, he says that if parents want their kids to stay in school, it's important to get them vaccinated. Right now, about 82 percent of 12 to 17 year olds are vaccinated, but only about 20 percent of 5 to 11 year olds. Joe and Lindsay, quickly, what about New Year's Eve? We know the city was planning an all out celebration. Are those plans changing? Yeah, there were some pretty strict rules around that. I mean, in order to be there, you had to show a fully vaccinated card. But now that could be up in the air. They're monitoring it. They're in communication. And, Joe, they say they'll make a decision by Christmas on whether people will be allowed. Joe. All right. Lindsay Reiser, thanks for your reporting from New York City. Let's go overseas. Omicron is changing holiday plans around the world. It's also putting a stop to the progress some countries were making in the fight against coronavirus. In a lot of places, Christmas 2021 is expected to look a lot like Christmas 2020. In Europe, we're now seeing some countries countries go back into lockdowns, and with that, protests have erupted again over new restrictions. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea is following the latest for us overseas. So, Kelly, let's start where you are in the U.K. Officials reporting a surge in Omicron cases there. What kind of restrictions are in place now, and could more be coming? Joe, good morning to you. Yeah, just in the past uh, week or so, we uh, experienced some new restrictions back in place uh, after um, weeks, actually months of essentially life as almost normal here. So now the mask uh, mandates are back in place. You have to wear a mask on public transport, in shops, uh, any public spaces uh, where there are big crowds. In addition to that, people are being asked to work from home and sort of limit their social interactions just to sort of think twice about uh, getting uh, into big groups and, and holding big parties and that sort of thing. And there's also a lot of talk about more restrictions coming, about possible lockdowns. Now, the government hasn't said that that's happening, but they also haven't ruled it out. The health secretary talking about that just this morning. Here's what he had to say about these new rules coming into place. Well, I didn't come into to government to, to restrict freedoms of people, but I think people understand you know, why uh, we, we are uh, you know, presented that action uh, to Parliament. But can I say, we are entering uh, this phase of this pandemic in a very okay. strong position. A very strong position because there are very high rates of vaccination in this country, over 80 percent of adults double vaccinated. And that booster program was really ramped up. So more than 50 percent of adults over 18 are now boosted as well. But take a look at this graph. It shows what's happening with daily COVID cases, and it's a pretty stark 
uh, example of, of just how quickly this is spreading. So for the past several weeks, I would say even months, we've been seeing an average of about 30 to 40,000 daily uh, COVID cases in this country. Just in the past week, Joe, that number has jumped. It's now double that. We're looking at 80 to 90,000 daily cases. And some estimates say that uh, this virus, this variant, Omicron variant, doubles every one and a half to three days. So those numbers can shoot up really quickly. Yeah, Joe. that is a rapid increase. I want to ask you about one country in particular, the Netherlands, now the first European country to go into a nationwide lockdown. What are cases like there? What does it mean for people who are celebrating the holidays there? Yeah, so cases in the Netherlands have been rising, but the health officials there say that the Omicron variant is not yet the dominant uh, variant in that country. But the prime minister said essentially they had to go into lockdown now to prevent an unmanageable situation in the hospitals. They're very concerned, again, about the rate of spread there. So this is what the lockdown looks like. It just went into effect yesterday. Today's the first full uh, weekday of a lockdown there. Shops, restaurants, gyms, hair salons, uh, movie theaters all closed. Uh, no fans in the stadiums for any sporting events. And this will all be in place until January 14th. And one more restriction in place there. Uh, people are limited as to how, how many visitors they can have in their private homes. Only up to four people visiting on Christmas and New Year's, the holidays. Uh, any other day, it has to be two Joe. Wow, you got to pick who you want at your place for Christmas. Real quickly, Kelly, on this one, we are seeing more protests because of more restrictions. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, protests breaking out in several cities across Europe, London, Paris, Barcelona, a couple of cities in Germany and in uh, Brussels as well. Most of these protests were largely peaceful. There were some scuffles with police and some arrests in Belgium, uh, as well as in London over the weekend. People really... Um, angry about new restrictions, about vaccine mandates in particular, and also vaccine passports. All right, Kelly Cobiea with a look at what's happening overseas in Europe. Thanks so much. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. So, doctor, this morning Moderna announced its already approved booster significantly raises the level of antibodies that can fight the Omicron variant. That sounds like good news. What does this mean for people who got this booster? It, Joe, it translates to what we had hoped for, that the mRNA boosters are effective against the Omicron variant. And this is important, that Moderna booster dose is a half dose. The company is also testing a booster dose of the full kind of original first and second doses. So it's likely that could be even better. But bottom line, no matter what, get your booster doses if you're eligible and you can and get an mRNA booster. We just heard from Kelly about the surge of cases overseas in Europe. They're also seeing spikes in infections among kids. So here in the U.S., there's no booster yet for kids between 5 and 16. No vaccines at all for kids under 5. In fact, Pfizer, as we learned over the weekend, had a setback last week when it came to vaccines for very young kids. When do you expect kids under 5 might be able to get vaccinated, especially in the wake of that setback? Yeah, Joe, so this was a significant setback. But here is some comfort. The company is already working on not having to redo everything, but basically adding in a third dose for those younger children, which means it's not a booster, Joe. It would be a three-dose series. But that's important because what it does is it delays it by just a couple of months, not six to eight months because they have to start over again. So I think that's important. And the most important way to protect your younger ones is to have everyone around them vaccinated and symptom free. I think that's key going into the holiday season. Speaking of the holiday season, a lot of anxiety right now. People are debating that do they go through with their holiday plans, with their travel plan, plans, how many people should come over. What's your recommendation for the holidays? Are we looking at possibly another Zoom Christmas and New Year's? I think that some people who just don't want to deal with the risk, which I don't blame them, Joe, I have patients in this category who are older, immunocompromised, or just really stressed about the holidays, Zoom or alternatives are certainly reasonable. But here's what I'm telling people. Don't cancel your plans if you're fully vaccinated, boosted, symptom-free, and you have a way to make sure the people you're seeing are in the same condition. And of course, tests are in hot commodity right now, but if you can get a hold of some of those rapid tests, 
that can be critical, not for everyone if you don't have enough, but for some of the people that are flying or commuting. And remember, flying is very safe. Air circulation on planes, very safe. High quality masks, even safer. So have confidence if you meet those conditions, but give yourself a little bit of flexibility and latitude if you're just nervous and you need to put a pause on some of this. All right, Dr. Patel, appreciate some of the comforting advice this morning. Have a good one. Thanks. The White House is doing some damage control this morning as President Biden's Build Back Better legislation now hangs in the balance. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin says he'll vote no on the nearly $2 trillion bill, which puts the president's domestic agenda in serious jeopardy. Manchin made the stunning announcement on Fox News yesterday. I've always said this, Brett. If I can't go home and explain it to the people of West Virginia, I can't vote for it. And I cannot vote to continue with this piece of legislation. I just can't. I've tried everything humanly possible. I can't get there. You're done. This is, this is a no. This is a no on this legislation. I have tried everything I know to do. NBC News political reporter Sahil Kapoor joins us now, along with NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman, who's in Wilmington for us following the president. Good morning to both of you. So, Sahil, let's start with you. Why is Senator Manchin saying no to this legislation, and how much did this catch Democrats by surprise? Well, many Democrats were certainly shocked, Joe, but Senator Manchin has had concerns about this legislation right from the beginning. He's never been particularly enthusiastic about it. But he has heavily negotiated it. He has shaped this legislation every step of the way, from the cost, keeping it under $2 trillion, which was his demand, to uh, the various provisions in it. There were a lot of sacrifices made on his behalf. So the understanding that Democratic leaders had was that he would ultimately get to yes based on all the compromises that they made for him. But at the end of the day, he said yesterday in that uh, explosive Fox News interview that he still has concerns about inflation that are not... Uh, adequately dealt with, that he's worried about the new Omicron variant of COVID and says the government should spend all its time tackling uh, those two things. And crucially, he has problems with one core uh, component of the structure of this bill, which is that a number of provisions expire over one year, two years, three years. He wants to assume that those provisions get extended over 10 years, which obviously makes the bill much, much more expensive and makes it all but impossible to pay for. So the only way to move forward with him seems to be to structurally change the bill, which is going to be a bitter, bitter pill for Democrats to swallow. Josh, let's bring you in here. President Biden is spending a long weekend at his Delaware home. How much of a blow is this to his agenda? What is the White House saying in response to this? Well, it's devastating, Joe. It is the whole Biden agenda wrapped up into one legislative vehicle that now doesn't seem to have any pathway uh, to victory. The White House also caught off guard by this announcement. Uh, officials saying that the White House got about a half an hour heads up from not Joe Manchin himself, but from a staffer. Uh, the White House then trying to frantically call Manchin before his interview with Fox, according to a person familiar with the situation, but he did not take that phone Phone call. Now, the White House is not ready to declare Build Back Better uh, dead. And in fact, the White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki put out a really blistering, pretty shocking statement yesterday, going straight after Manchin, uh, accusing him basically of being a liar and disclosing some internal deliberations from those closed door negotiations, saying that on Tuesday, Manchin actually came to the White House and on paper, face-to-face -face presented Biden with a proposal that Manchin could support. The White House felt it wasn't exactly what they wanted. There were some holes in it, but they at least thought it meant, okay, he's still on board for the general framework of what we've discussed. And therefore, when he came out on Fox and said, you know, it's over, I'm not voting for this, they felt that was a real reversal of positions for him. So now the White House saying, look, Joe Manchin changed positions once. Maybe we can get him to change positions again and come back Back to this bill, but it's difficult to see after uh, this exchange of tough words between the White House and Joe Manchin how the table is set right now for further productive conversations. All right, so there you see some strong reaction from the White House. Sahil, what's the reaction been like among Democrats on Congress? Are they hopeful Build Back Better could be saved? A mix of feelings from Democrats in Congress. Many House progressives are furious. That is a prevailing emotion, I would say, among uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the squad in the House, which says it warned all along that this would happen. Remember months ago, there was this big debate about whether to link or delink this with the infrastructure bill. It ended up being delinked. 
many progressives were upset about that because they feared that Manchin would walk away in particular, uh, that he was not as invested in the Build Back Better Act as they were and that they needed the infrastructure bill as leverage. So that's part of it. But the other, the other uh, takeaway from the Democratic congressional reaction is that they're not ready to give up yet. A number of them see a path in Joe Manchin's comments yesterday. Uh, to potentially salvage this bill. It would require shrinking it substantially. It would require focusing on a small number of programs uh, to try to kind of compress the bill and have these programs last over 10 years and pay for them fully. Let's play some uh, clips of what the, the Progressive Caucus had to say, what members of the Progressive Caucus said yesterday. I mean, we, we all knew that uh, Senator Manchin couldn't be trusted. Um, you know, the, the excuses that he just made, um, I think, are complete We have been, and let me be clear, there are six of us who had been saying this all along. Representative Ocasio-Cortez, Representative Presley, Representative Tlaib, Representative uh, Bowman, Representative Omar, and myself, we have been saying this for weeks that this would happen. That we will bring a strong bill to the floor of the Senate as soon as we can, and let Ms. LeManchin explain to the people of West Virginia why he doesn't have the guts to stand up to powerful special interests. All I want for Christmas is a senator that has compassion for the American people and not contempt. Now, a source close to Manchin telling me that hypotheticals are possible about the legislation being salvaged, but it is difficult to see, uh, given this nasty back and forth that they're having, the fact that they're questioning his character, accusing him of going back on his word, that's not sitting well with the senior senator from West Virginia right now. Yeah, much more to come there. Josh, before we go, I want to ask you about our top story. The president going to deliver remarks on COVID-19 tomorrow. Quickly, what can we expect from that? You know, the president had already laid out a winter plan for dealing with COVID, but the White House says he needs to go farther and he plans to go farther with this speech on Tuesday, where officials say Biden will announce new steps to help communities dealing with COVID-19 and will also issue a stark warning about what is to ahead this winter as we face this surge in cases, particularly from the Omicron variant, Joe. Sahil, Josh, lots to cover this morning. Thank you both so very much. President Biden is calling on the EPA to investigate the role of climate change in the devastating tornadoes that struck five states over a week ago. At least 93 people were killed and dozens more injured. Well, the families continue to clean up from the destruction left behind. Scientists warn it may not be the last time we see tornadoes in December. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez explains why. From Kentucky to Illinois, Arkansas to Iowa, this morning communities are rebuilding after those rare December tornadoes. The level of destruction uh, we think now is in the billions across Kentucky, and it's going to take us some real time. But we are not broken. We don't break. With the National Guard, we took in the widespread damage across Kentucky from the air. It's just utter devastation at the scope and the scale from this altitude. It's just, I mean, it's just terrible. The National Weather Service has now classified the main tornado that decimated Mayfield as a powerful EF4, packing winds of up to 190 miles an hour. It was on the ground for more than two hours. Experts are now questioning whether these kinds of weather events might become more common. We had tornadoes in December, like we've seen in the last few days. Uh, the record warm air mass we've had is a, a huge factor. Bob Henson is a meteorologist for Yale Climate Connections who says violent tornadoes might not be more frequent, but their timing may be different. What is happening is the seasons are getting reshuffled and rearranged. So here we are with a tornado outbreak in December. Um, the same changes might also bring us fewer tornadoes in the summertime. Uh, we might not have a strong jet stream in the summer as the climate continues to warm. So more than really an increase in violence of tornadoes overall, uh, we're seeing shifting in both in where tornadoes happen and when they're happening. So this storm is headed your way in the next 10 minutes. In Kentucky, despite warnings from local meteorologists, the sheer power of this December twister seemed to take many people by surprise. Donna Maceda was driving home from out of state when her daughter Brianna called to tell her the storm was barreling toward their house. All I could hear was her screaming for me and uh, mom, I don't know what to do and mom, I'm so scared that I didn't know what to say. Like, what do you say? What do you say? 
when you witness this. This is our first up close look at the candle factory that was obliterated. More than 100 people were working here. Eight of them were killed. The only thing I remember after that is I heard all kinds of noises and the next thing I know I open my eyes and I'm stuck. I'm, I can't move my legs. So all this concrete had just it fallen on top of you. Literally a wall, like a concrete wall was on top of me. 21-year-old Michaela Emery was among the workers who survived after being trapped under a concrete slab for six hours. The death of one of her co-workers nearby haunts her. It hurts so bad and it's not, there's nothing that I can do, but that was my friend and that still is my friend. That is the impact of this tornado outbreak. The scientific reason behind it is less clear. It's something to be aware of as climate change unfolds, especially uh, just keeping in the back of your mind, um, we can expect the unexpected when it comes to tornado season more and more. Our thanks to Gabe Gutierrez for that report. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather looking forward. Michelle Grossman joins us this morning. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. And the good news is we are relatively quiet over across the country. We're mild in the middle of the country, nice and quiet. We do, though, have some storm potential in the southeast, and then we have some wet weather in the west. So let's start in the southeast because we are looking at a southeast soaker. We're going to see a frontal boundary and then a low pressure system kind of develop along that boundary today. So it's going to bring isolated showers today from Texas to Florida. We're already seeing this at this hour. And then it's going to strengthen overnight, and that could bring a few strong storms tomorrow. So when we look at tomorrow, at least at least tomorrow morning, we're looking at the potential for some strong gusty winds, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see a few spin ups as well. So we're going to watch that very, very uh, closely. And there is a low threat for some hail as well. Now, back to the West, we're looking at a very active system. We've seen this over the past couple of weeks, really month actually. So that December deluge. And that's going to continue for this holiday week. And we're looking at rain, we're looking at snow continuing. And that's going to continue to impact travel there, although the snow lovers are happy with the uh, skiing conditions. Conditions. And then as we look towards tomorrow, rain and snow stretching into central California. So even as far south as San Francisco, and that could trigger some rock slides, some mudslides in those burn and scarred fire areas. So winter alerts, we're looking from uh, the northwest into the northern plains, the Rockies as well, where we could see additional uh, three to 10 inches of um, of. Uh, snow, excuse me. And then we're also looking at some rain as well as we're looking from the northwest into central California. So San Francisco, you're in for some rain as well, where we could see an isolated three inches uh, today. So today's forecast, we're looking at really nice conditions, Joe, in the middle of the country and then just watching that rain in the southeast. Back to you. All right. Sounds good. I think we'll look a little further ahead in the next hour. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah. Yep. Coming up, closing arguments set for today in two high profile cases. In Minneapolis, the trial of Kim Potter, the former police officer charged with the killing of Dante Wright. We're live outside the courthouse with what to expect following her emotional testimony last week. And in New York, the defense rests its case in the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell. We'll Look ahead to the closing argument set for today. All that next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. The trial of Kim Potter is nearing a conclusion with closing arguments from both sides expected this morning. The former Minnesota police officer is charged with two counts of manslaughter in the killing of Dante Wright. On Friday, she took the stand and gave some tearful testimony. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster has been following this and joins us outside the Hennepin County Courthouse in Minneapolis. So, Shaq, walk us through what Potter said on the stand this past Friday and what has been the reaction to her testimony. Well, there's definitely been mixed reaction to the emotion that you saw in the courtroom on that Friday, both Friday morning and into Friday afternoon. And according to the pool reporters, the two reporters in the courtroom who were watching uh, this and seeing the jurors' reactions, there was not much reaction from the jury, even during those really emotional moments when some, at one point you heard the defense attorneys ask for a lunch break because Potter was struggling to get through the testimony. We got a sense of the timeline from her perspective, from the stop, the traffic stop that she said she likely wouldn't have initiated, but she allowed to go on because she was the field training officer in that position to the moments before the shooting as she watched Dante Wright struggle a little bit with the arresting officer before he tried to get in the car. And then she really broke down when it got to moments detailing the shooting. Listen to how she testified on Friday. It just went chaotic. I, it, And then 
I remember yelling, Taser, 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 and nothing happened. And then he told me I shot him. You heard her later explain that her memory essentially went out after that moment and picked back up when she was in an ambulance and then at the police station. During cross-examination, you heard the prosecutors underscoring the fundamental differences and whether or not she knew the differences between a taser and a firearm, which is what she ultimately used. They went through the training that she went through every single year, including weeks before the shooting. And she, they, you heard them emphasize the idea that she didn't help or she didn't radio in uh, the mistake that she said she made after that shooting. Instead, she was uh, crying uh, and reacting to the shooting, but never conveying that information, suggesting that she knew it was a mistake. So that is what you heard in testimony. It was a really emotional day that you saw in the courtroom. So, Shaq, as we mentioned, closing arguments are scheduled to get underway today. What should we expect to hear from both the prosecution and from Potter's defense? Well, during the eight days of testimony, you heard a lot of evidence admitted, a lot of exhibits, a lot of training material. What you're going to hear during these closing arguments are both sides try to connect this to the law. The prosecution is going to say that this was a 26-year veteran of the force. She should have fundamentally known the difference between a taser and a firearm, and her mistake, as she sees it, was reckless or uh, it was uh, full of negligence. You'll hear the defense come back and say that if you listen to the law enforcement testimony that we heard, including from the former police chief of the Brooklyn Center Police Department, they say that her action did not violate policy. It did not violate the law. They even say that if she intended to use her firearm, that was still allowed under policy. So you're going to hear two different narratives in that courtroom, both from the prosecution and the defense during their closing arguments today. Jack Brewster, thanks so much. To another major trial now, closing arguments also expected today in the case of Ghislaine Maxwell. That's the British socialite accused of recruiting and grooming girls for convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The defense rested its two-day case on Friday. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns joins us with more on that. So, Dasha, we heard from several defense witnesses on Friday. Did they shine any new light on this case? Hey, Joe, as you mentioned, just two days of testimony from the defense. In fact, this entire trial uh, had not quite lasted as long as, as folks were going to expect. They didn't think we would be at closing arguments this soon, but here we are. Uh, on Friday, the defense uh, called two witnesses, basically intending to dispute the allegations made by the alleged accusers. Um, Eva Anderson Dubin was a one-time uh, girlfriend of Epstein and remained uh, close friends with, with Epstein and uh, claimed that she had never seen any sort of misconduct uh, on the part uh, of Epstein. One of the allegations is that uh, Maxwell helped facilitate group massages that were sexualized. In one case, um, one of the participants was a woman named Eva. Uh, she denied that, that that was her, that she ever took part in it. The prosecution also uh, showed a flight um, a manifest that showed that uh, Eva Anderson Dubin was on the same flight as one of the alleged accusers, a woman going by the pseudonym of Jane. Uh, she denied that as well, but interestingly, also said that she has a medical condition that impacts her memory. So some of the questions, uh, she said that it was hard for her to recall because of this condition. Uh, another witness, Michelle Healy, worked for Epstein for uh, a time and, again, disputed that she ever saw anything uh, that was uh, tied to the sort of misconduct that is being alleged by uh, the prosecution. Uh, but the government, uh, in cross-examination, asked her if she'd ever been to any of the homes where some of this uh, activity allegedly happened, and she said no, again, making their case that, uh, you know, these, these witnesses are, are, are not giving the, you know, are not giving that argument. Now, Dasha, one person we did not hear from was Ghislaine Maxwell. The judge asked if she would testify on Friday. Why did she refuse? Uh, she said that the government had not made their case beyond a reasonable doubt, and so there is no need for her to testify. Uh, and frankly, we weren't expecting that to happen in, in these cases where there is such a high-profile uh, defendant. Oftentimes, they do not take the stand, so not a surprise there. Yeah. All right, Dasha Burns, thank you so much. Time to take a look at what is making news around the world this morning. Claudio Lavanga is with us from Rome. Claudio, good morning to you. 
Good morning, Joe. Well, days after the Philippines were battered by the strongest typhoon of the year on record, of course, uh, this year, well, the death, count, the, def, the death toll is still rising and the devastation it left behind is becoming clearer by the day. Now, at least 146 people are known to have been killed by Typhoon Rai as it battered through the Philippines and through towns with winds of up to 121 miles per hour with gusts of 168 miles per hour. Now, unfortunately, the authorities uh, say that the death toll may rise because there are many towns that are still cut off and cannot report back. And following an investigation by the Spanish newspaper El País, um, the Catholic Church in Spain has opened its own investigation into the alleged sexual abuse of hundreds of children by members of the clergy in the past 80 years. The El País said, it, said that it took three years to put together a 385-page dossier on the case, which the correspondent from El Pais uh, handed over personally to Pope Francis on a recent flight to Cyprus. And bird watchers all over the world were watch out uh, for, or they have been called to watch out for the 10 most wanted birds. Well, now there are some birds, like the one called the black brown bubbler, uh, that haven't been seen in 10 years, but they have not been categorized yet as uh, uh, extinct in the hope that they will show up or somebody will spot them. But I presume that birds like the black brown bubbler have just flown away into hiding because they're afraid and, and they're actually ashamed of the, na the name they were given. I mean, imagine you're watching a bird and say, hey, that's the black browed bubbler. Is that, yeah, well, that's not me. It's tough to say. Maybe the bird's like, hey, I I'll come back. You just, you just got to change my name, all right? So. <laughs> all right, Claudio, exactly. thanks so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, sideline, the coronavirus sweeping through the sports world, forcing several leagues to postpone games and raising questions about the rest of the season. We're going to bring you the latest next on Morning News Now. You first saw it in the Harry Potter movies and later in real life, but the game of Quidditch, inspired by the films, will soon get a new name. The sport now resembles soccer and field hockey, and it's played as a contact sport with broomsticks. And now U.S. Quidditch and Major League Quidditch announced that they will conduct surveys over the next few months to decide on a new name. The leagues say it's changing for a few reasons. One, because the name Quidditch is trademarked by Warner Brothers, which limits its sponsorship and broadcast opportunities. Another reason they say is to distance themselves from Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling, who has faced criticism for her views on the transgender community. The game was created by two college students in Vermont back in 2005 and has played in more than 30 countries. 48 passengers aboard Royal Caribbean Symphony of the Seas ship have tested positive for COVID after docking in Miami over the weekend. At least one of those passengers was confirmed as an Omicron case. Royal Caribbean says passengers were notified of the cases and the positive passengers went into quarantine. The company says all, also says all of the cases were either asymptomatic or they had mild symptoms. 95% of passengers aboard the ship were fully vaccinated. Royal Caribbean says this incident will not impact future trips. Some of the biggest sports leagues in the country are postponing several upcoming games as COVID sweeps across teams. The NFL quickly moved three of its games after more than 100 players tested positive for COVID last week. This was the first time the NFL took the step of postponing games since the season began in September. The National Hockey League has suspended all cross-border travel until after the Christmas holiday. Nearly 10% of that league has tested positive for COVID. And in the NBA, at least 19 teams now have players entering the league's health and safety protocols. NBC News reporter Gary Grumbach joins us now from outside the Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C. with the latest. Gary, good morning. So every one of these leagues spent their off seasons preparing, creating protocols to try and prevent a spread like this from happening. So why do we think we're seeing these outbreaks? And do some feel the protocols in place that, that they are doing enough? Hey there, Joe. Yeah, well, it's important to remember athletes, they're just like us. They go out shopping. They go out and go to holiday events with family and friends. They go out to eat at restaurants, and the virus is just as transmissible for them as it is for us. So that's part of the reason. The other part, and doctors have been, you know, lots of discussion about whether there's too many protocols or not enough protocols in all of these leagues. Doctors say they're simply following the science. NBC News spoke to the chief medical officer of the NFL about this outbreak. Here's what he had to say. 
Well, I think there are a couple of factors that are driving this uptick in positive cases. First and foremost is this Omicron variant. Um, it's almost like a brand new disease. It's certainly different than anything we've seen before, and it's going to cause us to need to evolve our strategies and, and everything that we've thought previously about the pandemic. I think secondly, we've recognized that immunity is going down for people that have had their vaccines in the past. Uh, we did a study of antibody levels in our staff, and we saw the same thing that others have found, and that is the longer ago you had your vaccine, the lower your levels of immunity. Now, it's important to note that in the NFL especially, it's not that these players aren't vaccinated. The NFL has a 95% vaccination rate among players, and among NFL personnel and staff, it's at 100%. Joe? Yeah, those players are just like us. They shop and go to restaurants. They also breathe heavily all over each other during those games. So that might also play a role in this. Now, looking forward, Gary, are leagues restructuring their protocols to try and protect better against Omicron? Yeah, Joe, these leagues are doing everything in their power not to shut down the games here, not to shut down the season. They want this just as much as the fans do. But it really comes down to what we're seeing here. And the NFL is actually instituting a number of protocols, including uh, mandatory masking in all team facilities, making to-go food options more available at team cafeterias so you don't have a whole bunch of guys in the cafeteria eating together, and making meetings all virtual. That way you don't have a whole bunch of guys together in a locker room chatting together. Uh, we did speak to the NFL chief medical advisor about the outbreak, more about this. Here's what he had to say. It's hard for us to forecast where this is going. I think one of the things we've learned about this pandemic throughout is that it's extremely unpredictable. And so we always state that we're going to let health and safety guide our decisions. We don't want to put teams on the field together unless we feel good about the overall environment and the safety for everyone involved. So we'll just continue to look at the data as it comes out and make the best decisions we can. And, and we'll let health and safety drive those decisions, which is what we did last season and what we're doing this season as well. Now, it's important to remember, you know, sports is a business and businesses need money to survive. So this becomes a conversation like we've been having for two years now, public health versus economic health. Joe? Especially with the holiday upon us here. All right, Gary Grumbach, thanks so much for your reporting. Appreciate it. Coming up, fighting back against drone attacks. When we return in NBC News exclusives, we get an up-close look at the technology meant to help protect our troops. The countdown is on to get all your Christmas gifts out the door, but with supply chain slowdowns and shipping delays, many worry their perfect present may not arrive in time. A new report is breaking down which carriers are kicking it into high gear, which ones are lagging behind. Our very own Savannah Sellers takes a closer look at the delivery rush. The final sprint to Christmas, putting carriers to the test. This is what we do. So this is our playoffs, playoffs for the season. A new study finds that so far this holiday season, both UPS and the U.S. Postal Service are delivering your packages on time 95% of that time. That's up 7.5% from this time last year for USPS. But for FedEx, they're lagging behind at 85%, down 9% from last year. They have had a little harder time with hiring temporary workers in certain markets around the country. But overall, experts say shipping companies are doing well because of more hired workers, increased hours, and expanded facilities. They're doing even better than in previous years? Yes. They added capacity after seeing what happened last year. Today is actually my deadline for ordering to try to get things out by Christmas, so I've just been working hard to get things processed as quickly as I can and shipped out. It's also thanks to more planning by shoppers. The consumers have helped them with making deliveries on time by going and buying more items in the store, which reduces the demand. I've got a lot to do, but I haven't done any of it yet. Even for last minute shoppers, you won't have to rely on a Christmas miracle to get packages like these to your loved ones on time. Shipping deadlines are quickly approaching. For the most express services on major carriers, you have until Thursday or even Friday, Christmas Eve, but it'll cost you. To send a pair of shoes overnight across the country, act now. Some carriers are charging over $100. The race now on to get last-minute gifts under the tree. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Silvana Hanau is with us this morning. Hey, Silvana. 
Hey, good morning. Yeah, so Amazon won't reinstate a ban on workers having their phones on warehouse floors. The move comes after at least six employees were killed when a tornado hit a facility in Illinois this month and amid the spread of the Omicron variant. Bloomberg reports some workers have received messages the ban was being postponed until further notice. Amazon started allowing warehouse workers to access their phones when the pandemic began last year in case of emergencies. The company says it's looking for ways to improve safety procedures. Meanwhile, Tesla is making supercharging free at some of its stations during off-peak hours during the holidays. Those hours are 7 p.m. to 10 a.m. local time between December 23rd and 26th. The deal is limited to about a dozen states, including California, and the stations are mostly located near major routes and urban centers. Tesla's supercharger network is straining to handle a growing customer base. The company has vowed to triple the size of the network within two years. And the NFL, NBA, and NHL are dealing with COVID outbreaks right now during their seasons. Major League Soccer, however, just ended its season with some positive news as it looks to negotiate a new TV contract. The MLS Cup averaging more than 1.1 million viewers on ABC, with New York City FC beating the Portland Timbers for their first championship. That's up from last year's final on Fox. Industry sources say MLS is seeking $300 million a year in a new TV deal, up from the roughly $90 million it gets now from ESPN, Fox Sports, and Univision. Back to you. All right, that's quite a raise. All right, Silvana, yeah. thanks so much. You got it. Now to an NBC News exclusive, a behind-the-scenes look at new technology to fight back against drone attacks, which are now considered a major threat to U.S. troops. NBC News National Security and Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby got a sneak peek. Here's her report. They're the newest threat on the battlefield. Small drones, often armed, capable of evading air defense systems, at times with deadly consequences. Small drones like these have become one of the U.S. military's biggest threats. The reason? They're really hard to stop. Good hit. NBC News got an exclusive look at one system the U.S. military is already using to protect troops in war zones, and it can operate with very little human involvement. This is Lattice. Powered by artificial intelligence, it detects possible incoming threats from miles away, immediately gathering and processing information from a network of radars, cameras, and radio frequency. And, unlike older systems, identifying exactly what the threat is in real time. This might be hard for the human eye to distinguish that this is a drone. It's actually relatively straightforward to a computer. Lattice can determine whether something is a possible threat and launch a modified racing drone to get a closer look all on its own. In this demonstration, the white drone is the enemy and the black drone is the interceptor. The interceptor drone it's launched, it's locked onto the suspicious vehicle, and now it's saying to the user, this is suspicious, do you want me to take out this incoming threat? That's right. And with just one button, the user can now give the uh, interceptor the command clear to attack. Now the interceptor is going to accelerate into the target from beneath uh, and destroy it. The incoming threat is down. That's right. The system can actually attack an incoming drone on its own without a human being giving the command. 99% of what it's doing is done in Lattice, which is our AI-driven operating system. Let's the robots do what robots are good at, let's the people do what people are good at. And unlike other counter drone systems, Lattice doesn't need power or Wi-Fi. It's all powered by solar energy. But there are concerns about the growth of artificial intelligence and computers making critical decisions in a conflict. But it does raise important questions about where is this going, but ultimately keep humans still in charge of the use of force. The future of warfighting with fewer warfighters involved. Courtney Cuby, NBC News, Apple Valley, California. Coming up, a Spidey smash. The new Spider-Man movie breaking box office records in its opening weekend. More on the huge turnout and what it could signal to the struggling movie theater industry. Hollywood is celebrating this morning after the latest Spider-Man movie smashed box office records over the weekend. Many hope it's a sign of better times ahead as the film industry struggles and Omicron cases rise across the U.S. Despite growing COVID concerns, Spider fans turned out not only setting an all-time record for the movie studio, but also for the entire industry. 
seven. After a rough two years for Hollywood and movie theaters, the superhero is swooping in for the holidays. Spider-Man No Way Home made an explosive debut in theaters this weekend, shattering box office records, bringing in a stunning $253 million here in the U.S. This is a spectacle. This is a celebration of cinema. To see this kind of reaction. Why make these films? The movie industry has taken a major hit amid the pandemic. Many theaters have struggled to stay open while keeping patrons safe, some limiting capacity and offering reserved seating. Some innovative movies drew audiences on streaming services. Washington Heights. Some big movies earlier in the year, like Lin Manuel Miranda's In the Heights, struggled to draw people out of the house. Recent releases, like the star studded Dune, have found success, both streaming and in theaters. Now the industry is hoping the web-slinging hero played by Tom Holland can rescue that American tradition, the weekend blockbuster. This movie has to be seen on the big screen. After just three days in theaters, it's already the highest grossing film of the year and the third biggest opening weekend in movie history. Pre or post COVID, this is a massive number, but the fact that it happened still during COVID is extremely impressive and quite surprising. A press tour from celebrity couple Tom Holland and Zendaya didn't hurt. And neither did fans flocking to theaters to avoid spoilers. Uh, I don't think there was an empty seat. It was full. As the country gears up for an uncertain 2022, many hope it's a spidey sense of good things to come. In case you need more proof of how big this opening was, no other COVID-era film has even crossed the $100 million mark. In a single weekend, the film has already brought in more than half a billion dollars worldwide, so it seems like our friends overseas are just as eager to watch their favorite films on the big screen. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now, but the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.